bit around my travelling. I'm off to uh, Paris on Wednesday to speak at the OECD, so um, I'll do what I can to get it filled up as I, as I go through the lecture. Uh, is that light enough for you to see, or is it a bit hard to read the screen? Yeah. That's okay? Yeah. All right, okay, good, stick with it. So what I'm going to do today is start going through different schools of economic thought. Now, how many people knew that there were such things as schools of economic thought before last week? Some of you did, that's good. Okay, most of you thought this is economics, is that correct? Okay, you're coming to university to learn economics. That's pretty much what most students think when they come to university. And so what you've learned in the textbooks is a particular school of economics called neoclassical economics, and I'll be talking about that today. Uh, what I'm going to be covering, some of it will be quite technical. You're not expected to know the depth that I'm going to give you in this lecture for this course. It'll be something which comes like, I think will be useful next year or the year after. So don't, if you see some mathematics and it freaks you out a bit, don't worry. Okay, we don't expect you to reproduce that in exams or essays or anything like that. But it's giving you a bit of background that you do not get in textbooks. Because the textbooks, unfortunately, aren't, the reason I don't use a textbook for this course is I regard the textbooks as quite, there's a word called, have you heard, have you heard the word mendacious? Okay, have you heard the word Donald Trump? Yes. Okay, it's like getting a lecture from Donald Trump about the state of the United States economy. Okay, it's, it's lying to you. So I want to give you a truthful background, and that's why the, like, there's no textbook at the moment that really does that as well as I'd like it to do. But what I want to cover, first of all, now is the assessment as well, because we have changed the structure of the course quite significantly just in the last week. The reason is we had some unexpected staff changes. We couldn't fill some of the tutorial positions, so we had to change how we do it. I think it'll make the course better, but it's going to be challenging. Okay, so both for both you and both for you as students and for us as staff. Uh, so I want to go through the details. So there's three forms of assessment for the subject. Uh, one is an essay on, on the methodology of economics, which is basically asking the question: How should you do economics? And as I covered last week, that comes down for most economists to the question they ask themselves that sets off how they analyse the economy. So the question that the mainstream asks is, can a whole bunch of markets reach equilibrium with nobody coordinating them? Almost nobody. Okay. That's the question they ask. The question that the post-Keynesian school, which is the one that I'm regarded as being part of, asks is, what caused the Great Depression and can it happen again? Now, as I said last week, they're both reasonable questions. Okay. You couldn't rule the question out automatically is a bad starting point for economics. So the question then is, once you've got that, you then build an approach to doing economics, and that's called methodology. And then what you'll find is the different schools have very, very different ideas about that. So we want to set an essay that gets you to look at the range of the schools now, and just giving an overview, a fairly simple point by point, this is what this guy thinks, this is what somebody else thinks approach. Nothing Nothing too detailed, but at least enough you can distinguish what those different approaches are. Then the second part of the essay is going to combine two assessments together. It's both a group assessment and an essay. Now, who's done a group assessment at school before? Anybody? Did you like it or not? You didn't like it. Okay, I don't blame you. The biggest group assessment I ever did had 28 people in it. Okay, it was a nightmare. Um, it only got a credit mark in the, uh, for when I did the assessment. That was my, um, my, well, it was actually the first year of a subject that I, I was a, a final year student by this stage because I actually established the course that it was taught by back when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, but it was a hell of a useful experience at the same time. The trouble about group assessments is somebody always is still a slacker. Agreed? Okay. So we want to cover that as well. Uh, we're going to have group assessment. That will mean that if somebody's a slacker in a group, you suffer out of being a slacker. Somebody else being a slacker, not you. But what we're going to do to compensate that is you're going to be involved in the marking as well. And I'll tell you how you do that. Let's, I'll put it up on the website, but I'll cover it in a bit more detail today's lecture and next lecture. So, and also, because it has two parts, Part of it will be affected by the other people in the group, and if you work together well, and you really make the group work together well, you'll benefit from that. Okay. So this is partly a bit of a lesson about how you manage groups. I have to say that when I managed that group, back when I was doing this huge group assessment, 
back in 1975, a long time ago, I wasn't a good enough manager. I let people get away with being slackers. Okay? I let everybody else suffer because of that. So that's why I've got this rule compensation I've thought of today. So partly you'll do better if you manage the group well. Now that might involve saying to someone say, listen, you're just not doing a good enough job. Okay? It's hard to do that for somebody you know. It's equally hard to do with somebody you don't know. Okay? So that's an issue for you for management. And that's something you'll benefit from for later life, post-university, which is part of why we set to group assessments, because inevitably, when you go to a job, wherever you might work, at some stage, you're going to work in a group. And so learning what's the, the good and the bad of that is part of learning how to be an adult and functioning in the corporate life or a government life or even a university life. Also as part of the essay, and I'll cover that in a moment. Then there's a book report. Now the bad thing about this book report is the book is written by me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to mark it for that reason. Uh, we, we had a couple of books we could have set. Uh, I thought that some of them were too difficult, others weren't quite on the line of the approach we take. This is on the topic of the, the large part of the topic of this course, um, which is good, but, and it's short, it's 25,000 words, so it's not a large book to read. The other books were 50, 75,000 words. So 25,000 words, you can really read that in a day. And that's, that was another reason for choosing it. Um, that's my website, I'll just bring it up and show it to you, which is supporting the book. I haven't done enough work on putting a website. Hey, that's oh, wrong link. That was last year's book. Okay, hang on a second. I'll fix that up. Um, let's see. Just go inside there. Now that should have gone to my... Okay. Let's try that again. For some reason it went to the previous, previous book. It's strange. Okay, let's try it again. Yeah, okay. That's the website, and most of the information about the book is under this heading called Crisis. Okay. And I'll be adding to that, hopefully, in the next few weeks. But mainly, the, the book, the content you'll find of the book in the book, uh, I'll get copies in the library, but it's, and I, I feel a little embarrassed about saying you should buy it because it's getting money to me through royalties, okay? But it's cheap. It's about, uh, I think the wholesale price is £9.99. I think you can get it for £9 on Amazon. The, the Kindle is slightly cheaper, so it's not a huge rip-off. But I, I do feel guilty about doing that. If you want to avoid it, tell me, and I'll, I'll work out some other way to handle that. Uh, possibly putting a PDF up on the website. I'm happy to do that, if the website just for this course and not to be shared with anybody else. So if anybody prefers that, I'll, I'll promise I'll do that, okay? So if you don't want to buy the book, I'll put a PDF on the website, you can just use that. But I'm not trying to get any money out of this, I just want to get you access to the book. Uh, but if you want to buy it and read it, that's where you can buy it from. So the, I'll put the PDF up on later on today. So the methodology essay, have you heard, are you familiar with the concept of methodology? <coughs> Not particularly, I imagine, because you just learned from textbooks at school. Um, this is more a philosophical issue. How should one do something? Okay, so like, it's like, how should one play tennis? You know, should you do a double-handed backhand or a single-handed backhand? Um, and those are the sort of questions about which there are double answers. Not necessarily a right or a wrong answer. But what I want to do is have you look at these various schools of thought. So the mainstream is called neoclassical, but inside neoclassical there's a big division, so big that it's worth treating them as two separate schools. One group they call themselves um, freshwater economists, and that, that's because most of them develop their ideas in the huge uh, Great Lakes and freshwater system in America. So you know all the big, the big Great Lakes that separate Canada from America? Okay. I've forgotten their names, but Lake Ontario and Lake Michigan and so on. Chicago was on one of those lakes, and that's one of the main centres this particular approach began from. But also Minnesota is there, and various universities like that. And they tend to select people who've got a very... Um, what's the best way to describe it? A very optimistic vision of capitalism. 
that capitalism is always in equilibrium, always tends back towards equilibrium. And in fact, they even say that things like the Great Depression was an equilibrium event because something happened to change labour market rules and that made people decide to have a long vacation in the 1930s. 25% of the workforce decided to take a holiday. I'm not joking, but that's their view. Then there's what they call the Saltwater Group, and they tend to come from the coastal university. So Boston, for example, on the coast of America, that's where the Boston Tea Party took place. Uh, and you have the University of uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is the leading university in America, Princeton University, and so on. And they tend to be more critical. They say that capitalism um, does generally tend towards equilibrium, but it takes time to get back to it after it gets disturbed by some sort of shock. That's their picture. Then you have the Austrian economists. Now, they are e even more optimistic about capitalism, but their optimism says, well, it's, in, it's out of equilibrium, but that gives an op opportunity for entrepreneurs to come up with new ideas that can completely disrupt industries, and that's the positive thing about capitalism. On that front, by the way, does anybody by any chance watch Elon Musk's presentation on the weekend at the uh, International, I think it's Astronomy Conference? Did anybody see it? <coughs> You see? I've seen the highlights of it. Yeah. Huh? I've read the um, summary of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was quite mind. I mean, I'm, I'm a great fan of Elon Musk, so I'm a, bit, I'm a bit biased on that front. But if you haven't seen it, this is the sort of entrepreneurial stuff. I'll show you quickly. Entrepreneurial stuff that uh, that I, at, at, that um, Austrians focus on and say, well, that's what this is. What's great about capitalism that it lets people disrupt the system and make a profit by disrupting the system. So you might all know that, um, let's actually find this. Um, you might, you know he's planning to get rockets to go to Mars. You're aware of that? Okay. Well, what he explained here, and I'll just go to the back end of it, is that a rocket, of course, travels extremely quickly, and most of them at the you moment are used for website. low Earth I've orbit. You know, getting Wait. stuff into low Earth orbit so that's orbits the Earth rather than going off to Mars. And he's building a rocket that's big enough to take people to Mars, about up to 500 people in one, at one time. But at the end of the presentation, he explained, well, if you've got a rocket that can go to Mars and it can seat as many people as can be in an A380, but the hugest, the biggest uh, aeroplane we have right now. That's not a typo. Sorry? Sorry? Somebody's talking here. Oh. <laughs> Elon Musk, he mumbles, he mumbles. Uh, let's bring him up to see. Let's see if he actually does it. So look at the volume level up here. That'd be funny. Uh, volume, I'll make it louder. Okay, no, I can't. Okay. Let's see if I can make it louder here. He does mumble. A sweet fly. And um, I, the, the area under the curve of, of resources over that period of time should enable this time frame to be met. Um, but if not this time frame, I think pretty soon thereafter. Uh, but that's, that's, our, that's our goal, is to try to um, make the 2022 uh, Mars rendezvous. Um, um, the uh, Earth-Mars synchronization happens roughly every two years. So every two years, there's a, an opportunity for um, to fly to Mars. Uh, so then in 2024, uh, we want to try to fly four ships, uh, two of which will be crewed, and two, of which, two, two cargo and, and two, two crew. Um, the, the goal of, 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 the, uh, of these initial missions is to, is to find the best source of water. That's for the first mission. And then the second mission, the goal is to build the, the propellant plant. So we should, uh, with, particularly with six ships that are, uh, have plenty of landed mass to construct the propellant depot, uh, which will consist of a large array of solar panels, very large array, um, and then everything necessary to mine and refine uh, water, and then draw the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So let's say you know, he's finding it, but look what he also and, thought, um, what you can yeah, do. And, and over time, terrible. If you've invented a rocket that can get to Mars, and it can harry 500 people, why don't you use it to go to Shanghai as well? 
So this is the this this is the sort of mind blowing sequence to the end of this presentation. I'll see if I can. You know that on, on Mars, dawn and dusk are blue, and um, it's the sky. So the sky is blue and dawn and dusk and and red during the day. It's the opposite of Earth, and um, so we we looked at that, and the results are quite interesting. Let's take a look at that. Shanghai in 39 minutes, with no need for an airport, just a landing of dust for the landing station. Think about the amount of money that's involved in maintaining airports, two, three uh, mile long runways, all the staff, the concrete, all that goes. Okay. Um, you have a rocket that doesn't get destroyed, so you can use the rocket time and time again. The basic cost of the flight is the fuel you burn up, which is under a million dollars per flight. That could totally disrupt the airline industry. And that's the sort of thing the Austrians focus on about capitalism. What they're saying is this is a non-equilibrium event. Suddenly everybody's making money in the airline industry out of flying planes, which take you know, 12 hours to cross an ocean and stuff like that. And if you, generally, if you want to go to Shanghai, it's about a 14-hour journey. If you want to go to Sydney, which I visit regularly because that's where I'm born, uh, it's, that's a day. So now to go from London to Sydney would be about 45 minutes. Maybe, maybe an hour. Okay. You could literally live in the UK, work in Sydney and commute home if you didn't mind the time, time zone differences. That's what I call disruption. So that's the sort of thing that Austrians focus upon. Uh, and post Keynesians focus upon where crises come from and so on. So, whoops, um, that's the, the methodology leads you to look at totally different things. And that's the important thing we want you to talk about in the essay. Then, uh, is the economy, these, these are the questions we want you to consider. Once you've said, how should you do macroeconomics? Some of those things include, should you start at microeconomics and build it up? Which is what neoclassicals believe. Should you use mathematics? And the Austrians believe you shouldn't, most of them. Uh, is there any relationship between economics and politics? And neoclassicals try to say there isn't, and post Keynesians say there is, and Marxists say there's a very strong one, and so on. Is the economy stable or unstable? Does it return to equilibrium or does it get driven away? Those sorts of questions. What should the government do during a recession? So we wanted to, to take each of those schools and answer each of those questions. Uh, how should you address climate change? So you're not going to have many words to write, but I want you to write something about each of them that makes it obvious you're talking about a different approach to economics. Is that okay? And then rank them. This is a, like a smorgasbord. You know, you're seeing a smorgasbord of views of economics. You've eaten five dishes. I want you to now say which one do you prefer and why at the end. So that's the basic idea of the methodology I say. And that's due in November 17. So you've got a fair bit of time for that one. This is already up on the website, I think. I've got to check and see whether I put it up properly. But that's, that's the methodology I say. Now the group assignment and the macro, you've got to go from dukes of five. And you've got to answer one but the three issues. And we're going to set these out as uh, presentations you give in class when I'm not giving the lecture. So that's going to start, I think, in week seven. So first five weeks are me. Week six is uh, enrichment week, I think they call it here, when you have self-directed study. And then seven to nine will be group presentations where I think Rex McKenzie will take the class or Chris Stewart, one of those two guys. Have you met Rex or Chris yet? Yeah, good. Good guys. Okay, so the question is, first one question is, should the government run a deficit, a surplus, or a balanced budget? Okay. So you form a group, and uh, one of the, that's what you'd be advising 
the oven on. And this is each of you, each of you doing it. So we, we want to get you to get five presentations together or five essays. But this is what the groups are going to be covering. Uh, whether you should nationalise or privatise services like railway, power and health. Now, of course, they were all nationalised at one stage. They were privatised under Thatcher and Blair. And now you've got Corbyn saying he wants to nationalise them. So we want your advice from those different economic perspectives. What would a neoclassical freshwater economist say about it? What would a saltwater one say about it? What would an Austrian say? What would a post-Keynesian say? What would another school of thought say? How to reduce the dangers of climate change? So those are the three questions, each to be tackled from five different perspectives, five different theoretical perspectives. So what you have to do, you allocate one, one member to write an essay on one of those topics, and then you give a presentation across those topics. And that's a freshwater presentation, a perspective, a saltwater, an Austrian, a post-Keynesian, or one of the other schools that were just saying ecological, Marxist or feminist. You could get pretty esoteric if you kept on going, but that's pretty much the, the eight schools of thought that are, that are dominant. So you've got to form a group. The main thing you think about today is forming a group. And I'll, I'll get into more detail about how you actually, what you'll actually be answering and so on in next week's lecture. But to decide to form a group and then pick a week because, as I said, it's going to be week seven to nine, which is very soon, or weeks 20 to, 20 to 22, I think, which is a long way away. So you one or the other. Now, of course, that, um, as, as well as doing the group presentation, you write an essay. So the group presentation gets marked out of 25, and the essay gets marked out of 25. The group presentation, what you do collectively, determines the mark. The essay, what you do individually, determines the mark. So that sort of balances the, you know, being buggered by somebody who does a, a poor job and you all suffer. You can make up for it in your own essay. And if the person who does a poor job in your group they're also going to get a poor essay unless they do something magical. Um, so they're going to not, you know, being a slacker will, will, will backfire and they can't just free ride, in other words. That's what we're trying to, to avoid, that problem. But they're going to present either in seven to nine, week seven to nine, or weeks 20 to 22. And there's going to be roughly two presentations each week because if everybody gets involved, it's about 13 groups of five. That's why we chose five is the number of people in a group, but that way we get two presentations roughly every week. Maybe we'll have to have three. Maybe if people drop out, we'll have one less presentation, but that's five is a reasonable target. And form the groups this week. So when you take the break, I want you to think, is there somebody I really want to work with on this topic at all? You know, is there a good friend in the class? Is there somebody I think is bright? Or somebody I get along well with? Something like that. And if you can't find, um, so if, but if you do find somebody else you want to work with, you've got to get five people. I won't take down any group that has less than five in it. So you might have one other person you want to work with, then you've got to corral three others, that sort of thing. Or if you don't do that, I'll allocate them randomly, and you'll find out next week which group you're in, based on student numbers or something like that. Okay, so over the break, if there's somebody you really want to work with, get rid of them and see if you can grab three others you think might be good. If you have five, you're home and host already. But provide me with a group of five at the end of the lecture, and I'll then take those names down and you're a group. But if you don't have that, then you'll find out which group you're in through Canvas later on in the week. OK? Now, this is a long paragraph, but this is because, of course, presenting a week seven to nine is really pushing you. You're going to have to start working on the essay pretty much next week, the presentation. Okay, and you're not going to have as much background from me and as much feedback from listening to other people as the people presenting in weeks 20 to 22. So it would be unfair if we didn't do something about that. So what we've decided to do is anybody who presents in weeks 7 to 9 automatically gets five marks for both the presentation and the essay. Okay, you get five as a base and you're marked out of 20. Okay. Now anybody who does weeks 20 to 22 gets zero as a base and marked out of 25. So that's, that's, the, that's the payback for doing it earlier. Does that sound fair? Okay, that's what we're going to do. So again, I'll, I'll come back on, I want to get onto the lecture itself now, but that's, that's what we're going to do for the assessment. Sound reasonable? Good, okay, I think it should be fun. Okay, you're doing, all the presentations will be here. You're going to learn what each of you think. You're going to take over from the lecturer, and the lecturer will be sitting at the back of the room, just basically listening, maybe putting some feedback in, but pretty much it's going to be your job to make this time interesting for the weeks that I'm not lecturing here.
Okay. So last week I went through schools of economic thought and talked about, talked about astronomy as an example of how sciences develop over time or disciplines develop. Now what I'll talk about is the mainstream in this lecture, Austrians or libertarians next week, and then post-Keynesians the week after. And I'll talk about what they think about economics in general, how they evolved over time, and how they reacted to the crisis, because that's the biggest thing that makes your class different to classes that occurred before 2008. Before the crisis occurred, the last time there was a serious crisis was the Great Depression. Okay? And you know what it's like. People forget. Okay? So people who learned, learned economics between 65, when the economy was booming, and 85, or 2005, crisis, what crisis? But you guys, it's post the crisis, there's a big shift in how economics is developing. So this week I'll talk about the mainstream. You'll get more of that in economic policy and principles, but what I'll be looking at mainly here is how they evolved and how they've reacted to the crisis, because they are the group that is most disturbed by the crisis, because according to them, crises shouldn't happen. The fact that it did. Did you see that somebody predicted the world was going to end last Sunday? Yeah. Okay. What is he? What has he or she done since then? Changed their mind. Pardon? Changed their minds. So it's going to happen later. Okay. So they weren't wrong. They just got the date wrong. Okay. The world's going to end next week or next month or something. So people have a, something that totally contradicts their worldview, and they keep on going believing their worldview. That's not uncommon. It isn't just religious nuts who do that. So, people ask also for some more advanced reading. I'm going to add detail to Candace over time on that, but if you really want to get into the detail of mainly the mainstream and partly post Keynesian economics, then again, another book of mine is the appropriate one to read. But it's probably too advanced for this course. Okay? You don't need it for this course. If you read that, you'll really, you'll gun it, but it's hard reading. Um, it's available in the library and you can get it on Amazon as well, but that's just for those who really want to dive in and have a a deep look. But that's about 600 pages, okay? about 175,000 words. So it's a lot more than the other book you'll be asked to, to review on. But the mainstream, that's the supply and demand approach you were taught in high school. And there's two main branches, microeconomics and macroeconomics. And in micro, they talk about consumers on the one side and firms on the other. So consumers have got preferences and incomes they have to spend to fulfill those preferences. Are you used to that idea from school? So who did economics at school, by the way? Most who did not? First time. Okay, how are you coping so far? Okay. Um, and they have so demand comes from consumers who've got a set of tastes. We don't ask where the tastes come from. They just, you know, somebody likes Vegemite. They must be Australian, but you don't ask why. Um, somebody else likes uh, croissants. They must be French, but you don't ask why. So you just take the preferences as given, you take their income as given, that's the demand side. And then on the supply side, you're supposed to have a whole lot of firms who are all profit maximising and all competitive, so they can't affect the market. And they're, they're supposed to determine what the supply curve is. And you do talk about some of the market structures, so you talk about what's called oligopoly. And that's where several firms compete. Can you think of an oligopolistic market? Some market where lots of firms, made big firms, compete with each other, and you know their names. Supermarkets. Supermarkets. Supermarkets, that's a good one, yeah. Phone companies, yeah, three, etc., etc. Computer companies, Apple versus, well, it used to be IBM, these days it's Apple and everybody who makes so Windows, pretty much Apple versus, or Microsoft versus Apple. That's an old copy. Monopoly, can you think of a monopoly industry? Water supply. Pardon? Water supply. Water supply, yeah, but that's actually been turned into a competitive one. You're right, it started as a, monop as a monopoly and people argue it should go back to being one. Okay, but that's, it's rarer these days because they have to, a lot of them get broken down. And what seen that the role of the market is seen as bringing the supply on one side and demand on the other side into equilibrium. Okay, so what the, what, the, what the shoppers want to do is compatible with what the firms want to do. And nobody's unhappy. That's the idea of markets there. And macroeconomics talks about how aggregate things, the number of people who've got a job, the rate at which prices in general are rising, how fast GDP is changing, that's macroeconomics. And that's supposed, in this school of thought, they try to build the macro by scaling up from the macro. So they give you an explanation of how an individual consumer decides to demand, and then they say that can be used to derive a market demand curve. I'll talk about whether they succeeded in that later. They talk about an individual firm deciding how much to supply to make a profit, maximise profit. 
and that's how they derive the supply curve. So that's, that's their foundation. That's just simply what the neoclassicals do, and nobody else does that. Not explicitly. The Austrians, to some extent, do, but not as explicitly. But the neoclassicals explicitly try to derive their analysis of the overall economy by aggregating or extrapolating from what they have for the individual. Now, this is uh, two guys that I now know quite well personally having a debate at their university uh, with the mainstream economists. And he said there's no such thing as the mainstream. It's a bit like you from school. You thought there's only economics. And there's some fringe people. The thing is about fringe people, but that's what he thinks. So let's just take a look at his views. And this is, it's in, it's in Dutch, but the subtitle's in English. Once it starts to run. Um, ik weet niet precies wat hij neoclassiek noemt. Sommige mensen noemen neoclassiek één heel klein specifiek model, waar geen enkele frictie is, waarin alles werkt. En sommige mensen die noemen neoclassiek uiteindelijk wat de mainstream doet. Oké, okay, nou, voor de zin van die argument ja. laten we hetzelfde bedoelen. Zullen we het over de mainstream hebben of weet je over het hele klein nee, specifieke nee, mainstream? Absoluut. Okay, de, de ja, wat we in het onderwijs krijgen. Ja. Goed, gaat u ver. En daarnaast zijn er nog. Er zijn dertig andere. Je hebt de islamitische economen, de feministische, de Oostenrijkse economen, de post keynesiaanse economen. Noem ze maar op. Um, en de vraag is, moeten we die ook betrekken in het curriculum? Persoonlijk lijkt me niet een heel goed idee. Um, juist omdat die mensen maar ontzettend divers is. Die groep van verafsplitsing, de heterodoxe economen, zoals jullie ze ook, ook noemen, dat is eigenlijk een groep die zich wil onttrekken aan, aan de tucht en discipline van de mainstream. Dat zijn, uh, het zijn congressen, dat zijn toptijdschriften, daar stuur je je werk heen, dat zo gaat er bij alle wetenschappen. En het is heel erg lastig om erin te komen. Ja, de meeste van de top 5 tijdschriften worden maar 3-4% geaccepteerd. Als je niet inkomt, dan kan je weer proberen iets lager te gaan. Veel van de introductie, die willen er eigenlijk niks mee te maken hebben, die richten hun eigen tijdschriften op. En je ziet een beetje andere wetenschappen gebeuren, je ziet bij biologie heb je de intelligent design, bij klimaatwetenschap heb je ook een groep. Septi Now this is equating the other schools of economics to climate skeptics and people who don't believe evolution happened. Okay. Well, hij zegt ja? dat is een, een um, ideologische tunnelvisie. Ja. Klopt dat of klopt dat niet? Nee, dat denk ik niet. Ik denk Piketty is hartstikke mainstream. Die is uh, vrij links, denk ik. Terwijl er ook hele rechtse economen zijn. Dus ja. binnen het, de mainstream economen zie je heel veel verschillende benaderingen. Maar je, binnen de wetenschap wil je dat juist. Je wilt niet de politiek maken, je wilt juist de waarde vrij maken. Nee, daar wil ik wel even op ingaan, want u slingert een hele hoop beschuldigingen onze kant op. Uh, wij zeggen niet dat economisch denken politiek gekleurd moet zijn. Mm -hmm. uh, wij zeggen niet dat er niet links of niet rechts wordt gedacht, daar gaat het niet om. Ja, dat stond in jullie pamflet daar pas um, Het gaat erom, nee dat stond niet, dan heeft u niet goed gelezen, maar ik leg het graag nog een keer uit. <laughs> het gaat erom dat de mainstream economie, die is... Ik zal even schetsen, die is um, gegroepeerd rond het neoclassieke paradigma. Dat is één benadering die je in het onderwijs leert, het neoclassieke paradigma. En van die andere scholen. Maar wat bedoel je precies mee? Van die andere scholen die u net noemt. Misschien is het goed voor discussie. Als je precies bedoelt wat, wat de mainstream economie behelst, dan dan wij toch wel altijd hetzelfde hebben. Ik ben het aan het schetsen. Oké. Okay. Ja. Van. Er is dus één perspectief op de economie vanuit de, uh, de solistische, rationele mens. Dat is het basisperspectief. En daar zijn van een aantal scholen, zeg Keynes, de Oostenrijkse school, <coughs> uh, een stukje institutionele economie, zijn daar stukjes afgeknipt en op dat neoclassieke bolwerk geplakt. En let wel, het is een mooie benadering die wij leren. Het is, een, het is een nuttig paradigma, maar het probleem is, het is maar één paradigma. En als iedereen op dezelfde manier leert denken, dan lopen we rond met grote collectieve blinde vlekken. En in 2008 zag je dat daarvoor problemen uit kunnen ontstaan. Dus ik ben met je eens af en toe komen zeg maar, uit die, die niche gebieden goede ideeën, die, die, als die echt goed zijn, dan neemt de mainstream ze mee. Ja, dat is, uiteindelijk is de wetenschap, zijn allemaal superkritische mensen die voortdurend het werk van de anderen willen afkraken. Maar het is een blinde vlek. Blinde vlek. Um, wat bedoel je met de blinde vlek? Dat we niet genoeg oog nou, hebben voor, ja, voor ik, de ik, andere gebieden? Ik leg het uit. uit. Ja. In, um... Well, this you watch the rest of that link onto it, but can you get the body language between the professor and the students? Is the professor happy or not? No. Okay. He's actually the professor of these students, so they're actually taking on their own professor. This is a public TV station in uh, in Holland, so it's 
fairly aggressive confrontation. But that's um, the mainstream largely thinks there is no other way to think about economics but apart the way that they think, which it's hard to get past that there is another way. Um, so they largely think, well, anybody who doesn't think the way we do must be somebody like who doesn't believe in evolution, therefore believes God designed all the animals, etc., etc. And they're unscientific, they won't get published in leading journals because they don't deserve to get published. That's partly the mindset. Now, they actually see themselves as descending from Smith and Ricardo. If you ask a neoclassical economist who's the first major economist, they're likely to answer Adam Smith. Uh, and this is Mancu's textbook. Have you seen um, Mancu? Mancu textbook? Anybody use that at school? Or It's in the library. If you've, if you've, some of you have seen it. Okay. Um, so he said, um, households and firms interact as if they're guided by an invisible hand. You heard that phrase before? It leads to a desirable market outcome. He said, one of our aims in this book is to understand how the invisible hand works its magic. So he sees a direct lineage from Smith and the idea of an invisible hand making everything work out to a general benefit, even though people are trying to be doing things for their individual benefit. But he sees a direct line between himself and Smith. So this is the invisible hand statement. Now, that's taken from the textbook, of course, a bit hard to read. But the part he's talking here is saying many of the insights of Smith remain the centre of modern economics. Uh, what we do is we show his conclusions more uh, precisely and we can analyse the strengths and weaknesses of the market better today than Smith could do in his time. But there's, he sees a straight line between himself and Smith. Again, I know I go very fast in lectures, um, but did you see the YouTube link to last year's lecture? The, okay. I'll put this, I'm recording this one, so I'll be putting this up on, on screen for you uh, through YouTube. Um, now, funny thing is, if you actually read Adam Smith, and I do recommend, if you really are into economics, to go back and read that. But see, his metaphor about the invisible hand in the wealth of nations was actually explaining why he did not think that English uh, manufacturers would relocate to Portugal or Spain if tariffs were abolished. And his argument was more about nationalism. He said, by preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry. Okay. So he's saying, it doesn't matter if you cut, deregulate, the jobs won't go overseas, the manufacturers will stay in the UK because they like living in the UK. So funnily enough, economists think it was talking about markets reaching equilibrium. It was actually talking about manufacturers deciding not to take advantage of low tariffs. So this is one of the reasons I say the textbooks are either lying or they don't know they're lying. And I don't really know which one is worse. Because if you read the originals, you often find what's said in the textbooks about the originals is completely the opposite of what is actually said by the originals themselves. So that's why I would really like you to read the originals. Now the most crucial reason that they differ is that Smith and Ricardo had a totally contradictory view of what created value in a capitalist economy. And that's a complicated term, but to neoclassicals, value is utility. If you increase utility, you increase value. So that's subjective. So like this is not a bad cup of coffee from the orangutan um, place outside. That gives me higher utility than the coffee from Starbucks. You know, so this has more utility and therefore more value than the Starbuck one. But to Smith, value reflected effort. How much work went into making something. On that front, the amount of work that went into making this coffee is pretty much the same as applied in the Starbucks. There's no difference in the value from Smith's point of view. And he distinguishes in this way, in the very early stages, but he's only the second paragraph in the book. So value means utility, and value means purchasing power. Two different things. I said, the price of everything is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. So this cost me a dollar six, I think a pound, one pound eighty, I think. I would have paid exactly the same price for it if I bought it through Starbucks rather than the, you know, the place in the quadrangle down there. So from Smith's point of view, this has got an equivalent value. It might have different utility, but that's irrelevant to Smith in working out what value is. It's what can be purchased with it. Okay. So that's a, that's a difference between Smith and Mancu that I'm not sure that Mancu actually understands. Or maybe he thinks, I know that stuff that's too complicated for students, so I won't confuse them with it. Okay. Hard to say. So the neoclassicals say 
demand and cost together determine price, whereas what Smith is saying is cost of, cost produ cost of production determines price, and utility determines how much is purchased. So they separate out. Smith would separate out and say um, the, the cost of production, the price you pay for something, depends on how much effort it takes to make it. And then the amount you actually buy independently is determined by how much satisfaction people see themselves getting. Whereas the neoclassical statement, they both happen together. So that's a very different perspective on price. And you then that is, that is, again, I'm not sure that Manfield was at all aware of that difference. Now, so the real people who are the historical figures on which neoclassical economics, the mainstream that you learn at school and that is regards itself as economics <coughs> pure and simple, are not Smith and Ricardo. So other guys you probably haven't heard of, uh, Jeremy Bentham, a guy called Jean-Baptiste Say, and another one called Antoine, Antoine Corneau. Have you heard of any of those names before? Anybody? One has some. Which one have you heard of? Um, Pardon? Corno. 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 Yeah, because Corno's got this theory of a uh, different theory of competition. Yeah, Nash uh, the Nash equilibrium stuff, that's right. Yeah, so he's actually very early. He's about 1815. Moment long, long before them. Jeremy Bentham was a legal scholar. He's responsible for a lot of the structure of English law. Jean Baptiste Say was a French um, econ economist and political figure. Now, what they saw is, and this is where the mainstream comes from, they saw value coming from utility, from subjective satisfaction. And so here's Say in a very readable little book, which still influences a lot of people today, called Treatise on Political Economy. That's a link to our downloading the PDF so you can actually read it yourselves if you like. There is no actual production of wealth without an augmentation of utility. So you're in creating wealth as adding utility to something. So again, this, this, is, this contains water and coffee beans and a bit of milk. Okay? And the combination of the three turns it from three, three things, two of which I could consume independently, one of which well, I, I do occasionally eat coffee beans, but it's more satisfaction if you mix the three together. Okay, so the increase in utility is what Say sees as the increase in value. And that was a minority position. They were actually the outsiders. The majority was Smith and Ricardo and Marx saying utility doesn't set prices. So they ruled out the role of demand for setting prices. They said cost of production sets price, utility and demand sets quantity. Made them two separate. It became, the idea that utility was the essence of value became the majority position about the 1870s because in the 1860s, Marx published a little book called Das Kapital. Heard of it? Okay, you should take a look. Again, if those want to follow up with the stuff. This is the beginning of the argument for revolution against capitalism, okay. 1867. Fifty years later, you had the Russian Revolution. It was an anti-capitalist book. Um, so at the time Marx took Smith and Ricardo's work and made it anti-capitalist, the neoclassical started to evolve. There was a political revolt, in other words, behind the formation of the neoclassical school in the, late 18, the early 1800s to the uh, late 1890s. And there were three personalities who were particularly involved. Stanley Jevons, who was English, and actually spent some time in Australia, which back in those days was really doing something because it was a 100-day journey on a boat to get to Australia, not a 24-hour journey on a plane. Uh, Leon Volras, who was French, based in the capital of France, and modelled, he was by far the most dominant one in terms of his intellectual effect on the discipline over time. And a guy called Karl Menger in Austria, and Menger was the one who led to the Austrian views. So you get this three formations there. Jevons largely gives you the stuff you use today. Became Marshall was the one who built Jevons' ideas, but Jevons gave us supply and demand curves. Or rather, he gave the concept of that. Marshall gave us supply and demand curves. Volra was much more complicated. But both Jevons and Volras tried to build mathematical models. And this is a big thing about this school. They're trying to do what physics was doing at the same time. Now, how much physics do you think these guys knew? Not quite zero, okay. But a bit like, imagine you're reading newspapers today. You're learning, you're lucky in that sense. You can read about science advances that were published yesterday in the modern world. You're going back to the 1870s. If you're reading a book on physics, it's likely to be 20 years out of date. Okay. So they were basing themselves on physics 20 years earlier, which is an important point I'll cover 
in future lectures. But the guy who dominated over time, the one that they all tried to emanate, was Walras. And you'll see lots and lots of talk about Walras law when you're doing future economics at this university and anywhere else. Now, Valraz, he's the one who asked the question that I said, was saying this describes the neoclassical school. Can a system of free markets reach a set of prices that makes demand and supply equal in all markets? Okay. Reasonable question? Okay. That's, that's the question that neoclassical economics is still trying to answer. And what he was doing, in a sense, was taking what applied to individual markets in a very special institution in France called the Paris Bourse, and seeing if it could apply to all markets. So on the Paris Bourse, what actually happened, and I've got to check my historical details here, and I haven't read sufficiently on this myself, I've got to say, but in these markets, you'd have like the gold market and the silver market and the market for pigs and the market for other commodities, and there'd be traders who would be buying and selling, obviously things like gold and, and silver, depending on the price that was being offered. They might buy if the price was low, they might sell if the price was high, in their opinion. So you'd have a bunch of people in a room, there'd be an auctioneer who was employed by the bourse, and the auctioneer would set an initial price, probably based on last, last week's closing price, and then say, how, how many bids do I have? And if the number of bids to buy exceeded the number of bids to sell, so there was more buyers than sellers, he can increase the price until such time as everybody was happy. As many, there's as much gold being, being supplied at the price he called out as was being demanded, so there'd then be trade allowed in those markets. Reasonable model? Okay, it's, it's open outcry. We have, we have things like that in market makers and modern finance markets as well. So that's, that's the way it works for one market. Now, what, what Volra says, can this apply for all markets? So could we imagine a single place where all traders for all commodities come together and the same thing happens? Now, of course, in the single market in the bourse, no trade was allowed until everybody was, until supply equal demand in that single market. But what he imagined was, so you had the same sort of basic structure, an auctioneer who calls out a set of, not just a single price now, but a whole set of, set of prices, because if there's 20 commodities, you've got to have 20 prices calls out 20 prices, and then says, what's supply and demand in every market? And if he finds that there were some markets where um, demand exceeded supply, then he puts the price up there. And if there are other markets where supply exceeds demand, he drops the price. And he keeps on doing that until such time as all markets are in equilibrium. Okay. Can you see any problems with that? In the individual market, if you, put, if, if you put price up and demand exceeded supply, you're going to reduce, you're going to push the gap closer. Okay? What happens to other markets when you do that? That's going to change the income in all the other markets. So his little rule was you can't actually allow any trade until all markets are in equilibrium. And uh, this is how he wrote it. First, let's imagine, and it is imagination because it doesn't exist. Okay? Let's imagine a market where only consumer goods and services are bought. There's no intermediate goods, no factories being purchased, no coal and stuff like that. Once the prices have been cried at random in terms of one of them, so you choose gold perhaps or you choose pigs and say, you know, one ounce of gold costs 32 pigs or vice versa, cried at random, so you choose a random set of prices, each party then looks at all the goods and services they've got and think, well, given my utility and given the prices, what maximises my utility out of that combination? So some markets you might be a buyer and others you're going to be a seller. Okay, so the prices for those things where demand exceeds the offer will rise. The auctioneer then, initially all markets will be in disequilibrium. You might have one market that's actually happy. Okay? But they're not allowed to trade because the other 19 are not happy. And so you keep on doing this and doing it and doing it. And you said, over time, prices keep on jiggling around. And finally, uh, until such time you get to the point where the demand and offer for each good and each service are equal. So then you'll have equilibrium prices for the whole economy and trade will be allowed to take place. So let's put a, a modern spin on it. The prices for um, uh, earrings, if the earring market is not in balance, then the uh, game console market is not allowed to trade. Okay. Sound workable? 
you're right to shake your head. He couldn't prove it mathematically. He believed it was true. He made the ligand and saying, well, it appears probable because he's saying, if you look at what's happening, when you change the prices in one market, uh, then you definitely cause demand and supply to converge in that market. Uh, that's a direct influence. But there's <coughs> indirect influences in other markets. If you change the price <coughs> in B to make things in equilibrium, you change the income of people selling B, and therefore C might be driven further away from equilibrium. But what he said, well, B might be driven further away, but D might come up. So the direct stuff, direct changes directly push the markets together. Indirect, some will make push them further away from equilibrium, some will push further towards. So he thought, well, the direct effects are all in the correct way. The indirect probably cancel out. So over time, you should converge to the equilibrium. Okay, That's reasonable, but he couldn't prove it mathematically. So he called it groping. So imagine you've got a market for wheat, and you reduce the price for meat. Wheat, that's going to push the market towards equilibrium, which is what you're trying to achieve. Um, <coughs> So let the animation carry on a bit further. Okay. So you're closer by pushing the mark, by pushing the price down there. Okay. But then what happens with other markets? Well, you know, you've got cars and beds and cameras and fridges and holidays, etc., etc. You don't know what's going to happen to those markets. But he thought that all cancel out each other. Now, funnily enough, he actually I don't mention this in the lecture, I'll say for you here. He approached the world's best mathematician at the time, a guy called Henri Poincaré also French. And he asked Poincaré to support him and say this process would converge. And Poincaré refused. He said, I don't know. It's plausible, but I can't say it's proven. I'm not going to put my name to the saying this will work. Well, 20 years later, a bunch of mathematicians proved it wouldn't work. And they weren't trying to do that. They were actually what they call pure mathematicians. And what they were looking at was the mathematical property of an array of a square array of numbers where there are no negative numbers. And it's called a positive semi-definite matrix. They were simply saying, what are the characteristics of a matrix consisting of all numbers of zero or greater than zero? That's the only question they're asking themselves. Now, think about when you've got a production economy, can you produce anything using negative quantities of anything? You can't, you can't, can you? You don't use negative steel to make coal. So this array of numbers happened to correspond to putting Volra's model in a production economy. And what they proved was this process would not, it would, convergence would not happen because one of the key characteristics of an array of numbers is called an eigenvector or an eigenvalue. Ever heard of those? You need to be a mathematic. You've done a bit of mathematics. Cool, okay. An eigenvector basically says which way are you pushing something. An eigenvalue says are you pushing it or pulling it. Now what's happening if you imagine all these markets interacting with each other, if there's an equilibrium, you want everything to be pulling towards the equilibrium. Okay. So you want this, what's called eigenvalue, and that, all it means is principal number. The biggest number that specifies the characteristics of an array of numbers. Can you take a whole bunch of numbers, like with that, as I said, 20 markets. So imagine there's an array of 20 by 20 numbers. Let's talk about that market. There will be one number that says whether in the aggregate, this process is pushing you towards the equilibrium or pushing you away. That's called the dominant <coughs> eigenvalue. Just means that it's, it's, a, you, you, it's a way from taking a whole array of numbers and mathematically working on it to derive this number. And when they did it, they found that to have it actually converging, the number would need to be negative. And they found the number was positive. Totally independent of the economists at the time. What that means was when you apply it to economics in a production economy, rather than this process causing convergence, so markets get closer and closer to a set of markets that mean they're all in equilibrium, they get pushed further away. Now they won't necessarily go off into the planet, okay, because the further you move from that equilibrium, the more non-linear things can push you back again. Okay? So we're talking about very, very close to the equilibrium. It's like this very simple linear push. But further away, things can multiply on each other and pull you back again. So it doesn't mean you can't get an outcome. But economists actually became aware of this paper in 1960. And they, the first person to write about it called it a dual stability problem because what he worked out was there are two things you need to get in equilibrium. You want the 
you want the prices to be stable and you want the quantities to be stable. Okay? In a growing economy, you want the prices to be the same. Relative prices don't change. So one earring is worth three game consoles forever. Okay? But you want the quantities to be growing. So you want the quantity of earrings to be growing by 5% per annum and the quantities of game consoles to be growing by 5% per annum. Those are two conditions. And what he worked out was if one is stable, so the output one and relative prices, uh, if one is stable, the other is going to be unstable. And this is the mathematics. I said, you don't need to understand this. I think our friend at the back row might, might, might follow this one. I don't even know it already. But this is, this is the, the technical detail behind it. So output next year has to be one plus a growth rate times output the year before for every commodity. So output of earrings and output of game consoles growing at 5% per annum. Um, now I'm going to use Y and G. So Y just happens to be the symbol economists normally use for output, G for a growth rate. So that's your condition. Now your output's a list called a vector. So every element has to be growing at the same rate. And the simplest way to describe producing any of these commodities is like a cooking recipe. It takes, you know, one ounce of, 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 of one gram of gold and um, ten kilowatts of electricity and so many uh, units of, of silver to make a earring, that sort of thing. So you have an have a have a recipe uh, and different ones. Each each product, of course, has a different recipe. You can't make an earring with the same recipe and make a game console. So the array of numbers are different, but they've all got the same basic idea. Add different elements together. That's called a matrix. So I'm going to call it R for a recipe. Um, so this equation also has to be true. The, the output next year has to be the recipe times the inputs this year. You get that growth going on over time. Cover that? Now that means output in year 2016, I wrote these slides last year so I should actually change it, has to be R times the output the year before. So this is the output in 2016. Those are the recipes that help you make things from other things. And that's the output in 2015. So the outputs in 2015 become the inputs for 2016. Cover that? Now, stability means that they're going to slowly converge. If the growth rates start different, they're going to converge to the same growth rate. And that depends on this eigenvalue, which in English means characteristic value. So if the biggest number of that eigen, that characteristic number, is less than 1, and this, this is a discrete time process, so 1 is the, the vital number. If it's less than 1, they're going to converge over time. Now, the condition for prices is that you've got to be able to buy your inputs. If you can't buy your inputs and sell them for a profit, it's the same as everybody else's profit. You're not in equilibrium. That's more complicated. So prices have to be 1 plus a profit rate times the prices of the ingredients. You're going to multiply the prices by the volume to get the actual cost of buying them. That's what you sell the cake for. That's what you pay for the ingredients. And that's the profit rate, which has to be the same in all markets, otherwise you don't have equilibrium. Okay. Now, I'm going to leave you at that point, because I've already gone slightly over time. Come back and carry on that point. Have a break, take 10 minutes, and if you have anybody you want to work in a group with, see if you can pull five people together, come and tell me afterwards, or at least tell me by an email later on today, and we'll start after that. <laughs> So we got to that point talking about the, this mathematical, accidental math mathematical disproof of equilibrium from neoclassicals. So if I use, I'm using P now for prices obviously, and saying prices this year uh, have to be consistent with the rate of profit, which is the pi r bit there, and the, the prices, and those prices on both sides of the equation there. Now this is... When you look at it, when you, work, when you work with it, you've got actually two arrays of numbers. One is the recipe, and two is the inverse of the recipe. Now, it's, the math, it's quite a bit of mathematics in inverting an array of numbers as opposed to taking the inverse of a single number. So the inverse of three is one third, obviously. Okay. The inverse of a matrix also exists, but it's quite a bit of mathematical work to do it. So what you get is when you convert it down to this single number, that's the, the characteristic number, 
that is actually like a number like 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, etc., etc. So you can think about it just like a single individual number. And so what you have is stability of the, of the um, production process, which gives you the quantities, depends upon a number which might be, say, minus 1, or minus 2, let's say. What's the inverse of minus 2? It's minus a half, okay? Upside down, 1, one over. Minus 2 is minus a half. So the stability of this system depends upon both numbers being less than 1. Now, is there any number, individual number, which is the, in the inverse and the number itself are both less than 1? What's the condition you need for that to apply? It has to be a negative number. Okay. The inverse of minus 50 is minus 0 0.02. They're both less than 1. So the mathematical property that you needed to apply for the stability to apply is that the characteristic number of this array of non-negative numbers had to be greater than had to be less than zero. So if you have so if it's minus is 0 0.05, which is minus one over twenty, then the inverse has the inverse of the, the the inverse of the recipe has a characteristic of minus twenty. They're both less than both less than zero, so you're okay. Uh, and then therefore both the pro the production process, which gives you the quantities, and the pricing process, which gives you how much one unit exchanges for in terms of any other, would both be stable. Unfortunately, um, the recipe when, when you when you did this uh, numerical work, the mathematicians found out that the dominant number for this recipe matrix is greater than zero. So that meant if if you had if you had the stability of the production process depends upon the recipe matrix, and let's say its dominant value was 0.5, that would be stable. But that meant the prices system would depend upon the inverse of the recipe matrix, and that's dominant value would be 2, and that's unstable. So what they found was either prices or quantities would be unstable. The process would not converge. Okay. So it's quite a, this is, this is something you, I'm sure you didn't learn this at City. Am I right? Okay. It's pure mathematics. It's complicated pure mathematics. It's more advanced than they taught you. But it's not impossible to communicate what it means, and they didn't teach you that. One reason why I say what they teach is mendacious. So Volron's process wouldn't work. The whole idea of saying a whole bunch of people, 20 people in a room with 20 different commodities, trying to say 100 people with 20 different commodities, trying to work out a vector of prices by working in a random process would not converge. You'd never be able to trade. You'd all starve to death. So the answer is no. A market can't reach that point of equilibrium. Now that should have been a revolutionary point for the School of Economics. They should have said, well, since we can't reach equilibrium, therefore prices have to, to some extent, be disequilibrium prices. And therefore we need a theory of disequilibrium pricing. I wish they'd done that, because I wouldn't have a, the weird job I've got right now. Um, they continued believing that they could get there. And they'd use a number of reasons to try to get around this problem. So one would be, they saying, well, you're using rigid recipes. OK, you're making an omelette using two eggs. I can make it using one. And I can vary between one and two. And therefore, your rule doesn't apply. Well, that's true. But as it happens, the closer you get to equilibrium, the more the single recipe dominates the more the linear stuff dominates. If you're very close, if you're physically close to me and I push you in a particular direction, in effect, just my push dominates, okay? The further you get away from me, the more the gravity of the Earth dominates. Okay. So they, they ignored the nonlinear stuff. They, they, they said close to equilibrium are okay. No, in fact, the closer you get, the more these rules apply. Um, so the flexible stuff applies when you're far away from equilibrium. That's why it might bring you back. That's why the prices don't become negative or infinite, okay? Uh, but the equilibrium remains unstable even if you have flexible recipes. They also said, well, let's just add additional assumptions. If it's not stable as we thought it was, let's add additional assumptions. And here's Jorgensen, the guy who first realised the implications of this for economics, saying, well, to avoid dual instability, okay, we need a number of additional assumptions. I'm going to put an additional assumption in. Uh, and my favourite is a guy called De Bruyne, who got the Nobel Prize for this work. 
and he would be the guy who would be your hero, the heroes of the people teaching you at City. He said, an economic agent makes a plan now for the whole future. So there is no time. Today you go out and decide everything you're going to buy for the rest of into eternity. And therefore we can calculate an equilibrium and there's no, there's no time process at all. Uh, the other one is let's just ignore it and assume it's stable anyway. And that's pretty much what is normally done. They assume stability, even though if you take a look at the mathematical properties of what they're working with, they're unstable. Or they redefine equilibrium so it is stable. And they call it intertemporal now. So rather than looking at the input-output stuff, that's you know 20 commodities to make 20 other commodities next, 20 inputs this year to make 20 inputs outputs next year, what they're saying instead is we're looking at equilibrium over time. So what's going to give us a smooth path over time? And that's uh, in terms of technical stuff and what they've gone from. They used to do what they call computable general equilibrium models of economy. So they'd have an e they try to, like, for example, it'd be a Korean student, and I'm speaking from personal experience here, Korean student doing a PhD at the University of New South Wales who would try to build a model of the Korean economy using this, what's called input-output mathematics to build what he called the computable general equilibrium model of the Korean economy so he could predict where Korea's going to go in the future. That was what they did back when I was doing my PhD. Now, that same Korean economy would do what's called a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model of the Korean economy where there'd be only, normally, only one commodity, GDP. Okay. And looking about a smooth path to GDP over time and the input-output stuff, which gives you this problem, is ignored. So, they also have this same focus. So that, that's, that's the general thing about Volra. They did not achieve what they wanted to achieve, but they continued playing around as though they, they got the answer they wanted anyway. Um, Lucas, Robert Lucas, uh, who really dominated the development of economics in the 1970s on, he said that you, the real way to do mac macroeconomics, and now looking at macro, changing micro to macro, how do you do macro? You build it up for microeconomics. So their objective in terms of building macro now is to say, how do we take a model of individual firms and individual consumers and build a model of the overall economy? And the reason was we had this other stuff called ISLM. Have you seen that expression before, ISLM? Anybody would have seen it. Okay. Uh, you could just explain, you did a couple of years at City University where you got a very, very different treatment. So if you want to quiz them about what economics are like at other universities. What's your name, by the way? Huh? Yes, sir. Huh? G H A S S A N. Kassan. Okay. Have a chat to him and you'll get an idea of rather different approaches at other universities. So, what Lucas thought he would do, what economists should do, thought is take micro, take theory of supply and demand, which is individual market stuff, and build it up to macroeconomics. Now, the microeconomic model has consumers maximising utility, subject to a constraint, which is the amount of money they earn, their budget. Firms maximising profits, subject to the constraint of what are other firms they're competing with them. And they assume that competition's perfect. You've heard that expression before? Perfect competition. So all markets, nobody can influence price in any market, and you want all, all markets to reach equilibrium. And that's the, the nature of neoclassical models today. So the consumer's supposed to base, decide what to buy depending on their preferences. And they use what are called indifference curves to represent preferences. Who has not heard of indifference curves? Who has heard of them? You not know what I'm talking about, a couple have. Okay, some of you have heard of them. It's basically um, trying to sort of draw us like a hill. Imagine you've got a hill where the X and Y dimensions depend on how many units you're consuming and the utility is how high you get up the hill. And of course, if you walk around the hill, you can maintain the same altitude above the hill. And that altitude is going to be different X, Y locations, which are different units of commodities. So that's what's supposed to determine what consumers do. And then firms have fixed costs and variable costs, um, and they that sets their supply curve. And demand curve <coughs> is the cost curve for individual firms. How much does it produce? Well, the supply curve, pardon me, is the... I've got that wrong, there should be supply curve there. So what they have is a demand curve and a supply curve coming together to reach equilibrium in a single market. And they then apply this at the macroeconomic level to the entire economy. So with micros, you have how much, what consumers and producers and the market does today. Macro, in modern macroeconomics, the modern mainstream, 
is supposed to be what they're doing over time. So rather than just getting equilibrium at a particular point like today, which is what micro looks at most of the time, this is saying we want a smooth process of prices and demands through time. And what you're doing as consumers now is deciding what to consume over your lifetime. So you're in equilibrium all the way through time and firms are doing the same thing on supply. So at the micro level, as consumers, you're trying to maximise utility subject to a, a, product, a, a utility constraint. And this is what's shown. The more you consume, the more utility you get, but at a diminishing <coughs> rate. That's the idea of diminishing marginal utility. So there's rising utility uh, that, uh, as you consume more units of a good. I've got coffee here. But the change in utility is the slope of that utility curve, and that gets flatter over time. And then, of course, when you're looking at more than one commodity, you've got to have a combination of the two. So you can get more utility by consuming either more biscuits or more coffee. And if you, cons if you, if you consume less biscuits and more coffee, you can keep your utility constant. Okay, and that's the indifference curve. That's effectively like the, the contours on a hill. So I've taken exactly that thing you see on the left-hand side, three dimensions. And now the, the curves you see there are the contours where along any of those contours, the altitude, which is the amount of utility you get, is constant. And yet what you do is, how do you choose what to consume given that hill? Well, you've got a budget. The budget tells you how much you can consume. And you might be able to consume, say, eight biscuits or ten cups of coffee, given the relative prices of biscuits, of, of, of biscuits and coffee and your income. And the demand for, if you work out a demand for an individual consumer for an individual good, you hold their income constant, you hold the price of the good on the vertical axis constant, so in this case I'm going to hold the price of biscuits constant, and you vary the price of the good on the horizontal axis. And if you do that, you can therefore derive a demand curve for a single consumer at a single point in time. So you will hold the price of, of, um, of of uh, biscuits constant have a very low price of coffee so you can buy lots of lots of cup of coffee if that happens to be the relative price between coffee and biscuits then you look at a slightly higher price so you can still consume the same amount of biscuits but less coffee and then the same for a higher price again and the same for a higher price again and then what you do is you graph on another chart you graph well what are you consuming given those relative prices and you join the points up so there's the price, when the price is low for coffee, there's the quantity you consume. When the price is higher, that's the quantity. Higher still, and higher still. And you can then draw an individual demand curve. And what does the demand curve do? It slopes down as price fall, as price, um, hang on, price falls, you demand more. So the slope slopes down. Now the modern macro says, Let's apply exactly the same idea between working and not working for all of time. Okay. So you're making a decision, how many hours of labour are you going to put in over time? And therefore what you have is a trade-off between the amount of work you're going to do and the amount of leisure. Now how many hours in a day? 24. You can't change that. Okay. So it's a question of how much labour you're going to put in, given that you either work or you, take, you have a relax, relaxation. And to decide how much you do, you make a trade-off for your lifetime utility. So you're working how much to work now based on your utility for the rest of your life. So what you have now is a time path of consumption. Over time, here's one point in time, we've already worked that out. Then there's another point, and another point, and another point, and so on. And you want to be in equilibrium all the way through that time. So what a firm does is the same sort of thing. It just works out how to maximise its lifetime profits and it discounts those profits. So profits next year are worth less than profits this year because you've got a discount that's going to happen in the future. Okay. And the market then determines an equilibrium for that path, not just an individual point now, but a path you're looking puzzled. Have you seen this one before or you have seen it before? I can't see. Huh? Oh, too small, okay. <laughs> it's just a representation of each of those curves. Now, that's, that's the model they've got. The people, firms are deciding how to maximise their lifetime profits. 
And for consumers are working out how to maximize their lifetime utility. So how do you get business cycles out of that? Because we know there's booms and busts in the economy. Sometimes there's high employment, low unemployment, other times there's high unemployment. How do you get that? Well, what they'd say is there are shocks. There are things that disturb production, and in that case, Elon Musk's technology comes in and shocks the transportation industry because suddenly there's a new way to travel between continents. That's a technology shock. Or there's a consumption shock, so suddenly people start enjoying things called Pokemons. Okay. So what you do is the exogenous shock is taken as being outside the system. You don't know where it's coming from. That shock relocates that smooth path where you're maximising utility over time. And so you have, a, you have to jump to a new location. So you might have a... Let's say you've decided that your utility maximising amount of work is eight hours a day, given what you know about your utility now and technology now. And then this comes along and you decide you want to work ten hours a day. So you jump from one equilibrium position to the other, but you're doing 25% more work. So employment rises and unemployment falls. Or you might decide some te technology shock comes along and rather than working eight hours a day, you can maximise the utility by working six. So unemployment rises if you measure it. But they're saying it's not actually unemployment. It's people voluntarily deciding to work less. Now, this is how do you explain um, what's going on here? Well, for a while, you may accept being unemployed. And this is actually a quote from, I mentioned Robert Lucas at the beginning. He's, he's saying, if the current fall in wages is regarded as temporary, he may accept leisure now, brackets be unemployed. Now, who here regards being unemployed as leisure? Huh? That's what he's saying. They even explained the Great Depression that way. This is the, the first person who built these series is a guy called, uh, two guys, Ed, Ed, Ed Kidland and Prescott. And this is Prescott saying in business cycles, the ups and downs we measure in the statistics, rises in unemployment, falls in unemployment, and so on. Their response to persistent changes or shocks that change the path the economy is going to take over time. So if the shock pushes the growth path down, the shock means the economy is going to grow more slowly, more time is allocated to leisure. Therefore, people work less. And that explains the Great Depression. There was some shock that made people desire more leisure, so people took time off, and that's what caused the Great Depression. It's just a long holiday by workers. Sound convincing to you? Or something the person needs to have their head read? Yeah, the head read, frankly. So he's saying market hours fell low, and this is in the 19th, This is a quote from an academic paper. Okay, this, this is why I say read beyond the textbooks because when this stuff gets into the textbooks, if the person writing the textbook actually believes there's some profound truth here, they can't help themselves to try to make it look more reasonable. But if you read the original, you get the unexpurgated version. You know, it's a bit like the difference between a censored photograph and the real photograph, or the airbrush photograph and the real photograph. When you're looking in textbooks, you're looking at the airbrush picture of somebody. Okay. They've photoshopped their photograph. Would you prefer, if you're going to meet them, would you prefer the Photoshop version or the real version? Okay. I'm going to teach you the real version. This is the real version. So you see, in the 1930s, labour market institutions changed normal hours. I think these changes caused the Great Depression. They couldn't actually identify what they were. But he basically described the Great Depression as a decline in steady state market hours. In other words, a decline in the equilibrium amount of work that workers were willing to do. And that then turned up as a measured increase in unemployment. He said, I think this was the unintended consequence of policies. Government, government policy caused the Great Depression. Exactly what they are, I don't know. But he said, this is my overall conclusion. The capitalism is stable, and without any um, shocks, You'll get doubling of incomes every 40 years, and there was some change in the 1930s that lowered, um, lowered the employment rate, um, and that's what caused it. And the Keynesians were wrong. It wasn't that uh, employment was low because investment was low. 
employment and investment were low because there was some change the government made that made people want to take a holiday. Okay. Now, that was just too much, even for some neoclassical economists. And this is where the split between the salt water and the freshwater people apply. This is a freshwater economist. So they developed the technology, the, the new way of modelling the economy. They call dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models. They actually called them real business cycle models when they first came up with them. This is the sort of stuff you would have learned in the first year at City. Um, but others said, well, this is crazy. Um, I mean, they, they simply cannot believe that anybody sane could describe the Great Depression as a holiday. Holidays then often lead to Second World Wars. Um, so the idea that it's an equilibrium has to be crazy. So the new Keynesians, they also saw the, the saltwater people call themselves new Keynesians as well. They said, well, there has to be involuntary unemployment. The people who weren't working during the Great Depression were not taking a holiday. They wanted to find work and they couldn't get it. Okay, and that's much more what we think about the Great Depression and indeed the Great Recession. So they agreed that if markets were perfect, there'd be no problem. This all markets are actually imperfect. I remember one of the assumptions for this model was that all markets are perfect. And so we're going to be more realistic and say they're imperfect, so therefore there can be a shock and it takes a while to get back to equilibrium. So um, there's something sticky. Prices don't adjust perfectly. So a big part about the idea of perfect markets is any change in supply or demand is accounted for by change in price. And you move from one equilibrium point where the two lines intersect, one of the lines moves, and over time you move to a new point where the two lines intersect. But it takes time to get there. Okay? And that's their explanation. So they call this new Keynesian, uh, whereas the other one they call new classical. So you're going to see all these sorts of words which are a bit confusing. Um, the, the slang term is salt water versus fresh water. The more formal term is New Keynesian versus New Classical. They're all terms that they apply to themselves to describe how they thought, sort of in the terms of history of economic thought. So they, the New Keynesians, who are the dominant group, within the mainstream, 90% would be New Keynesian, 10% would be New Classical. Would have been even more, would have been 80, 20, maybe uh, 10 years ago. But so the, the, key, the key feature of the Keynesian approach, as they call it, is the absence of continuous market clearing. So rather than instantly jumping from one point of equilibrium, a shock, another point of equilibrium, this is saying, point of, point of equilibrium, a shock, another point, and you take time to get to the new point. And while you're taking time, there's either, sometimes during a boom, there'll be excess employment, so you get inflation, and other times there'll be uh, excess unemployment, so you get deflation and unemployment coming out of it. So they said, common to all these models is the prediction that the aggregate price level will decline less than proportionately. Therefore, the prices don't adjust instantly, and therefore, between one shock and another, you can have unemployment or a boom. Okay. In the middle, you have stability, but one side or the other, you can have a boom or a slump. So the price is too high means that subs you have sub-equilibrium levels of output, okay. and they're not chosen voluntarily. That's the key thing. So there's involuntary unemployment. So the policy implications of the new Keynesian approach, the old salt water approach, was that fiscal policy is ineffective because people can adjust to that. It's a bit more complicated than that, but I won't have time to cover it in this one lecture. But they, they said what we should do is inflation targeting. We should try to target a rate of inflation that gives us stability over time. And this came up from a guy called uh, Taylor. Have you heard of what's called the Taylor Rule? That's fairly detailed economics, so I'm not amazed you haven't heard of it. But he said what, what, it, what uh, the Federal Reserve what has done to over time tends to be, say, the rate of interest they set should be equal to the rate of inflation plus some fraction of the rate of change of output plus some fraction of prices minus 2%, which is, remember they're always talking about a 2% rate of inflation? as their target. This is where it comes from. They think 2% inflation gives you stability. 
and this is the rule, if there's if prices are rising a bit, let's say prices are rising at 1% more than 2%, so rising at 3%, you put the inflation rate to 4%, and that'll push it back down again. So they thought, whatever, whatever the rate of change of prices is, the rate of interest should be twice that level relative to a 2% equilibrium point. So at the moment, they're trying to push the interest rate below zero okay, because the interest rate is below 2% and they're trying to push it down. And theoretically, they came up with what they call dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. And they derive from this idea of utility maximizing firms on one hand, profit maximizing firms on the other. And it dominated the mainstream by the 1990s. Uh, now, some of the mainstream <coughs> criticised these models. So, you had one extreme saying, we assume equilibrium and perfect markets all the way through. That's the real business cycle, salt water, the freshwater model. You had others developing these models with disequilibrium for a while. There's a third group. It's not mathematical, but it's not easy when you look at economics properly. It's still complicated, so I want you to navigate through this. And people like Robert Solo said, well, the, the, both these ideas are crazy. Is it because um, the idea they have is an economy with a, a single immortal <coughs> consumer solving an infinite time maximization issue for utility. He said, it's far-fetched. We're assuming that they're working out some optimal growth problem, disturbed only by shocks, and the economy adapts easily to it. Uh, and everything's thought to be equilibrium. He said, we're supposed to regard that as a model of capitalism. This guy, by the way, Robert Solow is another Nobel Prize winner in economics. So what got, I'm describing here is a battle between people who have won Nobel Prizes in the same discipline. And he said, uh, the preferred model has a single agent maximising over infinite time uh, with perfectly competitive markets. He's talking here about the, the freshwater version. He says, how could anyone expect a sensible macroeconomics to come out of that setup. So he's being highly critical of his own profession. He said, I start from the presumption that we want macroeconomics to be able to cover occasional pathologies such as recessions, stagnations, even unreasonably good times. He said, a model that rules out pathologies by definition is unlikely to help. So that's him criticising the, the freshwater version and saying the very idea that you can imagine the economy is always in equilibrium and the Great Depression is an equilibrium event, you're off your rocker. He actually, he laughs at these people. He thought if Robert Solow was in a seminar being presented, the person presenting a real business cycle, he would deliberately laugh at them. Now imagine what it's like you're sitting in a room and a Nobel Prize winner is laughing at you. Not a nice feeling. And the title of this paper is called Dumb and Dumber in Macroeconomics. Anybody know the movie he's talking about there? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, what he's criticising is the freshwater stuff, but of course that might mean the saltwater stuff. Looks like, no, he doesn't believe that. He said, well, the simpler models that people have done have had no empirical success. They they deny that. They claim it has been empirically successful, but he says it hasn't. He said, well, that some of the freer spirits. And now he's talking about the saltwater model have allowed for imperfections. He said the model sounds better and fits the data better. He said. That's not surprising because they actually chose the imperfections to make it fit the data. But he's saying it's still unrealistic. Now, despite protests by people like Solo, this approach became dominant in macroeconomics. And it happened to coincide with what's called the Great Moderation. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Between 1992 and about 2007, the economic cycle seemed to get smoother and smoother, less crises, so 2007, yeah. Um, and the critics were actually quite triumphant about it. Well, they, 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 the professors were quite confident about it, and they were still confident later. So it began in 2007, August 2007, and the mainstream reaction to that was pretty relaxed. This is the Federal Open Market Committee that sets the reserve interest rates in America, and this is the chief economist of the Federal Reserve, saying in December, which is four months after the crisis began, that the economy will avoid recession and there'll be some fall off in inflation. Um, and, of course, that isn't what happened. A year after the crisis, a guy called Olivia Blanchard, who was at the time chief economist, well, he became chief economist for the IMF a year later. But this time he edited one of the world's leading journals on macroeconomics. 
and uh, end up saying the state of macro is good. So it's a year after the crisis began. The mainstream models did not predict the crisis, and he's saying macro is good. Again, I'm going fast because of the amount of time we have for this lecture. So they didn't expect the crisis to be severe. But if you take a look at what happened in terms of the um, of percentage change per year in real economic growth, it was the deepest downturn in 30 years. And in fact, in terms of the length of the downturn, it was the severest downturn since the Great Depression. So it was far bigger crisis than they expected it to be. And if you look at the level of growth for the economy on average, this is the rate of growth on average before the crisis. This is the rate of growth on average after the crisis. About a 1.5% fall in the rate of growth. That's huge. Because you have population growing at about 1% to 2% per annum, and technological change where you can use 1% to 2% per less labour every year, then on average you want about a 3% rate of growth for the economy to ensure that employment remains roughly constant. But if you fall in 1.5%, okay, from 3% to 1.5%, you're not going to have stable unemployment. You're going to have rising unemployment. So you've gone from 3% rate before the Great Depression to 1.7 cents since the global financial crisis. So it's a big, big crisis for them. And inflation became negative. So what they called the Great Moderation was this trend here. You can see that the peaks of unemployment getting lower over time and the peaks of inflation getting lower over time. And then, bam, this happens. Now, this is a, a bit of out-of-date chart. I've got to improve this one. But there's been an improvement in unemployment since then. But in fact, I'll have to bring it up live and let's give that a try. Uh, one of the resources we're going to show you later on is called the FRED database. FRED, St. Louis FRED. Um, <coughs> So this is looking at people who've got a job in the American economy aged between 20, uh, 25 and 54. So of course between 25 and 54 you finish university, you're not about to retire. You're either working or you're having kids or taking care of the kids. <coughs> well, <coughs> that was the peak level of employment for 25 to 54 year olds in the States, 81.6% of the population. And that was back in before 2000. In 2006, it was 80%. It then plunged down to 75%. It's risen, but it's still 78.4%. It's still 1.4% below, 1.6% below here. So if you look at the unemployment rate, it's got back to the pre-crisis level. But it's only happened because less people are working between those ages. And what are they doing? They're having more kids? Population growth's also slowed, okay? There's a substantial proportion of the American population that has not got back to work. And that's ignored by the mainstream. And it's quite amazing for me to watch this stuff because I'm seeing what's being suggested as policy by Janet Yellen. And we're saying we're back in a boom economy again because the unemployment rate is lower now than it was at the peak of the boom in 2007. But the employment rate is not recovered. And this is data they publish on their own website. Go figure. So, what do you do if your theory predicts that a crisis doesn't, won't happen and it happens, and the crisis lasts longer than you expect? Well, they thought maybe we should get rid of the theories. This was a paper from 2010, published in 2011, by a leading um, saltwater economist called Ireland. It's actually based in, well, in Boston. And he said, well, we can have other models where there's causal relations that lead to trouble, but what what actually happened is a series of shocks, and they just got bigger and lasted and, and got the shocks that disturbed the economy, putting it out of equilibrium, just got bigger over time. It didn't recover. And therefore our models can cope with that. We can just put bigger shocks in. He was quite happy that the model was okay like that. So the mainstream stuck to an equilibrium approach, despite the theoretical problems I've covered about whether you'll reach equilibrium or not and the empirical failure to see the crisis coming. You can tell I'm critical of the mainstream, I'm hardly disguising that. But they are chastened by the experience. So this is Blanchard again, the guy I quoted earlier saying the state of macro is good. In 2014, 
he came out and saying, well, the idea that crises aren't a problem uh, is wrong. This view is wrong. We need to have a deep reassessment. So there is some soul searching going on inside the mainstream. And they're now more open to alternatives. So here he's saying, uh, we need to have, let a hundred flowers bloom. Now there's a sort of thing we're doing at Kingston and teaching a range of schools. That's a good idea. Doesn't happen in a city, does it? Um, and some of the things they left out, uh, macroeconomic models don't have, did not have money or banks or private debt in them before the crisis. After the crisis, they're starting to add them. But what they're doing, and this is a, a early paper, but this is no, nothing different has happened since then, they add them as frictions. They say there are other things that slow down how fast you return to equilibrium. Now, does it sound sensible to say finance is a friction to you? Or would you regard finance as a lubricant? Does finance slow things down or does it speed things up? I think it speeds things up. It's more of a banana skin. But they are now adding financial frictions to their model to explain why it take longer to get back to equilibrium again. But they're still seeking to equilibrium. And this, I think, is Blanchard here. Um, and he's saying, well, obviously our models didn't cover the existence of dark corners in the economy. <coughs> um, he said, well, we need to have models that are designed the economy when it's in sunny, sunny climates. Yeah. <coughs> he doesn't know. That's, the dark corner is a place you don't want to be in. <coughs> but he doesn't know what a dark corner is. So it's, it's ironic, but he uses the expression dark corners. And he, he said the basic lesson is stay away from dark corners. Now, you can only stay away from dark corners if you if you'd identify the causes of them. His model doesn't have an identification of that. So it's quite weird. Uh, you really have people who are struggling. So these are some of the people I'm talking about. This is Robert Lucas. He's the guy who talked about uh, these models fitting the real world and everything being perfect. Thomas Sargent. Uh, those are the real cycles. Ben Bernanke is somebody you might recognise. from the, He's one of the saltwater people. Paul Krugman. You know, a couple of public sites, and Olivia Blanchard. Olivia Blanchard, by the way, is probably moving more in the traditional, and he's trying to identify, build models that can say what are the dark corners, but they still have no explanation what the hell they are. It's just a phrase he used. Um, so they're starting to question their own <coughs> validity now. Um, so why is the economy not rebounded? The growth, even though there's unemployment, as they recorded, is recovered, the economy is not growing at the same rate. It's, you know, three percent. 3% versus 1.25. Unemployment's recovered, but that's mainly because of that fall and how many people have actually got a job. Inflation is below their target. It's starting to get higher now, and that's certainly happening in the UK too. Uh, but at the moment in America, it's running close to zero. And they've been pumping money into what they call quantitative easing, but the economy has barely recovered, even though they've had interest rates at zero, or in real terms, less than zero, for going on several years now. So they've got split into two camps. There's the old-fashioned people who are going back to what they used to do before they invented real business cycle models. People like Larry Summers and Paul Krugman. And they're explaining the crisis in what they call secular stagnation. So their explanation of the dark corners is that there's been a fall in population growth and a reduction in technical change. And they're saying, how can we explain it? Um, how come we haven't had a recovery? Well, slower population growth and slower uh, technological change. That's one reason I showed you Elon Musk. Do you reckon in five years' time, if we go from catching planes to fly between countries to catching rockets, technological change has slowed down? Sorry, not going to wear that one. And the new Keynesians are simply admitting they can't model the model economy. So now I've got, this is one guy who was chief of one of these freshwater central banks called Narayana Kosha Lakota. It's one of the most beautiful names I think I've heard. In terms of, it's a name that rolls off the tongue. But he has come out and said he's comparing the serious models, the, the, the DSGE models, to toy models. He's saying for the foreseeable future we should stick with toy models, I'm not trying to make a complete model of the economy. I uh, said the starting point is we have a, a settled theory of the macroeconomy. He says my view is after the last 10 years that is wrong. We simply don't have a successful model. 
So they are in quite a bit of turmoil, the mainstream. Then you get, uh, let's see, that's more of Kosha Lakota. Olivia Blanchard, and this is after the Dark Corners paper, he said that we have three sets of choices we make. We model consumers, firms and financial intermediaries for micro foundations. We assume competitive economy and we estimate the entire model in one go rather than trying to estimate each equation independently. There's ten equations. We do them all at once rather than trying to fit them all the data. And he said, well, um, what we should do now, he's not sure. He's saying, first of all, what's wrong with the models? Well, they're based, based on unappealing assumptions. Not just simplifying assumptions, but assumptions that are false. Now, a simplifying assumption is where you say, you know that, say, 90% of something applies and 10% is the exception. So, for example, 90% of people are between 1.5 metres and 2 metres tall. Okay. So, a simplifying assumption would be assume everybody's between 1.5 and 2 metres. The exceptions, people below 1.5 or above 2. Now, what he's saying is neoclassical models model the entire world as if everybody's 1.5 metres tall or less. Therefore, what you do is you make all doors 1.5 <coughs> metres tall. Would that be sensible architecture? Okay. But that's what they're doing with their models. He said, secondly, how we test them is unconvincing. We set parameters not by fitting them to data, but by making guesses. And they're based, they're based on just blaming somebody else for the numbers that they don't work out. So a whole lot of the numbers they use in these models, you think you derive the models from data, they say, somebody else used his models last year, I'm going to use them too. Okay. I think I'd better get out of here in a moment. And then David Romer really lost the mainstream. So what I recommend is have a look at that paper for Romer. And I'd better get out of here because another class is coming in. So I'll put the slides up on the website as well. Thank you.